this is work that's going on in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, and but we do have significant interaction with uh, people here in this department, Gerald Papelka, Tony Ricci, and John Ogilai, under the uh, uh, approval, I think, of uh, Rob Jackler that have this interaction with mechanical engineering. Okay, here's what I want to cover, but relax. I'm just going to hit a few of these topics very quickly. Uh, first of all, what do I mean by basic mechanics? So I think in contrast to Stefan, who uh, cherry-picked to only look at 170 uh, uh, elements to track through the development, uh, uh, in mechanics, things are really very simple. Few principles. Stress-strain, that's a relation of a force measure and the de measure of deformation. And you'll hear a lot about the elastic modulus. It's Young's modulus. And that's for a solid. For a fluid, you have the strain rate, and the coefficient is the viscosity. So two basic properties. And how things move, you have Newton's F equal MA. And of course, relativity has been jazzy for some time, but 99% of planetary motion and, and uh, tectonic plates and all the way down to uh, the flow of ions are governed very well by F equal MA. So you've got another, another parameter, mass, coming in. Well, coming to the cochlea, what's the mass? It's all soft tissue, which has a density of water. Uh, and then you have some bone, density 2.5, not much room to play around with those. You have the viscosity of the fluids. The fluids in the cochlea, endolymph and, and paralymph, are both like water, viscosity of water. So what we have to work on, though, is the elastic modulus, because this does depend on the protein fiber and how much of it is in there. So um, it's better to have direct measurements, but um, we can also make estimates of what the, uh, the effective modulus for tissue is. OK, so really, I, I think of it, this is like the computer. What's the computer doing? It's adding ones and zeros. <laughs> so. Here, here we have something really basic, uh, simple stuff, but you can build up complex things. Of course, the complexity comes in the geometry, and we get lots and lots of parameters, thousands and thousands of parameters to um, uh, d describe the problem. And uh, so first, let me look at uh, some clinical problems. We are, we are trying to interact, trying to do something that's useful for the clinic. But uh, we've looked at these, at these problems. First of all, uh, the, well, here's for the geometry. Um, these are from the uh, micro CT scans for the human and the gerbil cochlea. But to convert, so the big problem is to convert this optical image into something you can compute. And that is not yet an automated procedure. That takes a fair amount of work. And, uh, here's one problem that we've addressed, this, uh, uh, the, um, the uh, dehiscence of the superior semicircular canal, where it's treated as a hole in the, in the bone wall there. And it has uh, the effect of decreasing the sensitive to air conduction. And when you push in on the stapes, the fluid has a much easier path to just uh, flow through the, to, the, to the window here rather than going into the cochlea. So you lose low frequency hearing, but you actually have hypersensitive to bone conduction. Okay, so the, the, uh, this is the air bone gap uh, with clinical measurements and average, and here's the calculation. Wow, we're doing pretty well with, uh, with that, without any fudging. This is, this is uh, just straight, taking those basic properties. Okay, here's another problem, uh, autosclerosis, in which you have bone forming around the stapes, basically freezing the stapes, which prohibits the uh, uh, air-conducted sound, pretty much. So it blocks the movement of the sound energy into the cochlea. 
Here's, here's an example of normal air conduction and, uh, at 1600 hertz, for which the middle ear is starting to flop around. It's not quite the, the piston-like motion that you, that you, uh, have, you normally think of. But the result is this traveling wave on the basilar membrane. Okay, now what's going on when you, when you freeze this is that the bone conduction still works. So conduction through uh, vibration, the probe on the, on the forehead or, or uh, anywhere around the skull, uh, you, can, you can actually hear. And so an approximation is that the cochlea, due to this bone conduction, is just being shaken, just given a translation. So this is just due to the inertia, the middle ear is flopping around, but what you end up with is the same traveling wave on the basilar membrane. Okay, so we do a calculation on that. Here's, here are the clinical results, first discovered by Car Carhart, 1950. And uh, this is the hearing loss. And what, what you see is a notch, the so-called Carhart's notch, which occurs at two kilohertz. Okay, we do our calculation just shaking the bone with the, with the stapes frozen. What's the result? Way off. <laughs> well, we get a notch. We get a notch, but, it, but, it's, uh, but it's way off. And uh, this is a case of just fudging parameters, increasing the amplitude. You've got to fudge parameters to very unreasonable values to try to bring that up. So what that is telling you is that you're missing something. There's something not in the calculation that is really there in the physics. And in this case, we think it is, uh, uh, it is uh, a pressure is also there when you have the bone conduction. You not only are shaking the cochlea, but you're squeezing it a little bit. And so this is a calculation with just a uniform pressure uh, acting on, on the, um, uh, the whole uh, cochlea. And um, just with the pressure by itself, there's no loss. Here's the law, here's due to shaking it, there's the pressure. But it's interesting that if you put the two together, you get a curve like this. So it appears, which is not too far off from the clinical measurement, so it appears that uh, the reality is that in bone conduction, you are actually having a combination of the translation shaking it as well as squeezing it a little bit. Okay, now for the active mechanics. You've heard a lot about hair cells, uh, particularly outer hair cells, and I want to show a picture of the uh, organ of corte again, the three rows, which you've seen many times today. And what I want to point out is this angle that the phalangeal processes uh, make. Here are the hair cells, and the phalangeal process is a bundle of microtubules connecting the end of the hair cell up to the, this reticular lamina. So here's a picture of that, that side, side view. Here's a model, here's a model of it. And the important feature is that the expansion, the motility of the, of the outer hair cells, <clears throat> this, this, everybody knows about motile outer hair cells, I presume, at this point. The shear on the cilia of the outer hair cells causes the, um, can cause the outer hair cell to expand and contract. And so the point is that a shear at this point causes the hair cell to expand and push down at this point, a little bit delta X1 away from, from this point. And in addition, a uh, cell over here is trying to expand, but that means the top is moving up, it's pulling up. So you have a combination of pushing down and pulling up. So we have a push-pull and putting this into some equations and putting that into the calculation, you get marvelous results. Here's a comparison of the calculations of the basilar membrane response for four uh, species and the chinchilla. Uh, the chinchilla and gerbil, we actually have measurements. So this is at a high 
say 80 dB of input sound, where you have little amplification, and a 20 dB, where you have a, a couple orders of magnitude of increase in the spike. So the beautiful thing about this, about this feed forward, you just turn it all on, and then for long wavelengths, the push and the pull cancel, no effect. For very short wavelengths, the viscosity of the fluid gobbles up the energy. Nothing happens. So it's like a bandpass of wavelengths that really get turned on, amplified. Energy is pumped into the wave. And this, this is what produces this, this uh, uh, nice peak. And here's the amplitudes, and here are the phases. So we're not so good on the phase here for gerbil, but not too bad for chinchilla. Well, you flip that and look at threshold curves, and here is a marvelous uh, experiment done by uh, Mario Ruggiero and collaborators at Northwestern. <laughs> In one animal, they measured both the basilar membrane response and the uh, eighth nerve response. So we have both neural response and basilar membrane response. And what they found was that uh, these two, one of these is neural, one of these is basilar membrane velocity. And they're right, uh, right on top of each other. And then, of course, here's our calculation right on the button. <laughs> Okay, for gerbil, we have just the comparison of the, our calculation and the neural. Not, well, it's not, not quite so good. Cat, it's a little bit better. And for human, this is done by psychophysics. It's not, not too bad. Okay, so, so this uh, feed forward backward really works very well. Uh, but the assumption that we're making is that these hair cells, the, so the bundle, uh, is, is working, the hair cells are expanding and contracting with each cycle of the, of the frequency. And this has been a problem because the electrical properties of the cell would indicate that it should roll off in effect uh, at frequencies much lower. But there are uh, experiments uh, done um, in Oregon and, and um, in, uh, here, uh, in, in uh, John's John's lab, Ogilai's lab, that uh, really indicate that they, they are, uh, the hair cells are working at the frequencies that you want. And furthermore, uh, Elizabeth Olson in Columbia, just a very recent work has shown the electrical field uh, shows this peak. So they really are working. And the question is, uh, how, how are they working? So that's still an, very much an open issue. Okay, well, the geometry, as I said, we get lots of parameters. We need lots of parameters to describe geometry. And um, <clears throat> so this, these are recent results. Uh, your son's was postdoc visiting, he just left. And uh, with the collaboration of, um, of the Ricci Lab and, and um, Heller, I think, uh, Heller's people uh, helped out a lot. But he's done um, the imaging for the, for the mouse, and uh, these are the hair cells uh, and, and uh, showing the side view. And to get all these angles, we want these angles. This is, we've never had this. And here's an example going from base to height. So we now have for the first time a detailed plot of the distribution, the way that these, all these angles vary. And the big, sort of a big surprise is that the angles are different in the different rows. So uh, the, we are eager to get this incorporated into a calculation and see the effect. Okay, now I'll jump to uh, uh, another development related to real people. So here are current hearing devices and um, a middle ear hearing aid. There's always a, a, a battery and, and um, uh, and, uh, a wire through the skin to transfer the vibration into the middle ear, or for the cochlear implant, you're, you're transforming again through the skin. Okay, but the, the ear lens contact, though my colleague Sunil has been very much involved with this, and uh, this is a device which, it's hard to believe that it works, but it does work. <laughs> okay. It uses light, a light transmitter, uh, to um, and the 
device mounted on the on the tympanic membrane can be put in and removed. No, no surgery is involved with that and just with this light transmitter. And the advantage of this is that you get a gain up to 10 kilohertz and conventional hearing aids go to about five kilohertz. Now, if you recall, five kilohertz is about the top of the piano keyboard, so you wouldn't think the frequencies above that are so important. But there have been a lot of studies that show the quality of sound in that high frequency range is important to people. And the, um, uh, a preliminary uh, group of clinical studies showed that they really did like, like this, and there's a more extensive um, uh, study going, uh, going on now. But for re university research, can we do more with this? Can we put, put that, that photo detector on a porp in the, in, uh, the middle ear for in uh, reconstructive surgery and transmit the light through the tectoral membrane? Let's see if that happens. Or if you want to really go further, how about for your, uh, your uh, cochlear implant? How about driving that with a photo detector through the tympanic membrane? So th this, is, this is something that uh, we have to yet to explore. <laughs> okay, well, there's various pictures of our group and we have had um, support and I thank you for your attention. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.